actually use to infer epigenetic mechanisms. Sorry, I think the online audience is now joining as well. Yeah, perfect. Okay, it's working. Nice. Uh, now my screen. Okay, perfect. So the idea in our lab is that we want to measure as many epigenetic modifications as possible to understand how they work together, right? So yeah, while you have methylcytosin usually as a switch that turns off gene expression if it occurs in a promoter, what is hydroxymethylcytosin doing? What is, if they occur together, how are they maintained over cell replication or over, over cell division and DNA replication? And for this, we want to measure all of them and we want to have a positive readout on the very same molecule. So and this is this is our idea. I mean, it's, it's not super new. Um, so in, in essentially what you want to get at the end is for each DNA strand, the information of methylcytosin, the information of hydroxymethylcytosin, the information of homocytosin. And ideally, and we have seen that yesterday that it works quite nicely with PacBio, um, the chromatin accessibility as well by using EcoG2 as a methyl transferase that marks the spots of the chromatin. So that would be our goal. And and what do you need for that? Because it's it's not so trivial. So if you if you get these signals from PacBio or from Nanopore, it's not that you immediately see a change like if you would do it in Illumina sequencing with a C to T conversion. Uh, this is not the case. So what you need actually as unique profiles or footprints for each type of modification that are not only strong enough for you to pick them up, but they need also to be unique in order for us to distinguish them. Yeah. So, and, and how do we approach that? We use different enzymatic and chemical approaches. We simply test them systematically. It's also not very new, um, but it has been done before, and people have also shown that you can actually measure hydroxymethylcytosin, for example, by glycosylating them, and then put them on PEG bio. You get a very nice, a better IPD signal. But still, the problem remains: how would you measure multiple modifications? And I think Nanopore has the, has a nice uh, release during the last month where they can already measure methylcytosin, hydroxymethylcytosin. Although I wonder, and and this is a question I have to Nanopore: how good is, is this combined measurement. So how precise are you when you measure two modifications? Okay, so, so normally we start by making model genomes. So we introduce a certain modification. In this case, we introduced methylcytosin and we also in introduced formal cytosin as this is one of our pets and we are very interested in how this modification behaves in certain cell types and during cell differentiation. Okay, so as you can see, we always run a negative control. So we have no modification. We have methylcytosin, for example. We always run on our, when we sequence also um, DNA that contains M6A, because this gives a very nice signal on both platforms, Nanopore and PacBio. So for us, it's a nice positive control. Um, if we can, can we actually pick the modification up by these unique um, profiles? And here we wanted to, one goal was how can we get a better signal for formal cytosine or how can we distinguish between meth, um, formal cytosine and, uh, so this is actually not right here, doesn't matter. So it's not carboxycytosine. Um, and how can we increase the sensitivity for methyl cytosine maybe? And this is then for example, how it would look when it comes from the um, PEG bio sequencer. So what you see here is the IPD ratio for different modifications. For example, you have the cytosine, which is basically giving you the baseline. You have the methyl cytosine that is actually not a very strong signal, but still good enough in, for, or in order to, for PEGBio to pick it up. You have formal cytosine, and you have here this our base X, so the chemical that we applied. I need to apologize that I cannot tell which enzyme we're using or what the base really looks like, but there's a... Um, yeah, patent filing. So I'm, I'm, and this is based on collaborative work with Thomas Carell and his group. So we're not, I cannot, cannot share the details at the moment. But you can also see that here after when the adenine and uh, the difference between unmodified DNA here, the adenine signal of, of IPDs, the methyl 6A signal from uh, is quite striking, right? So this is a signal that you can nicely distinguish. And, and I mean, in principle, this is our goal. Yeah, a signal that 
that is as strong as methyl 6A because this is super distinguishable. So and when we do our chemical treatment here for the for the space X, so which converts methyl cytosine to something else, we have here the um, this is how we can visualize it. So it's a different thing. You see the an entire you see parts of the lambda genome that we modified, and you see here highlighted the C CGs. And you can also here, we have here the uh, unmodified, the methylated, and then our enzymatic approach. And you see that uh, from yellow to blue, the, the IPD value increases. And then whenever you have a CG, you have an increase in this IPD values. It's not always at the, at the exact same base. So this is a footprint that we really need to understand. Um, you can also see that actually on, on nanopore. So when you look at the raw signal that is highlighted here, we have the unmodified, the methylated, and the treated DNA. You can see here where you have no CPG, there's no difference between the three samples. So the lines nicely overlap. But if you go into the raw signal, you can at some points pick up differences from um, black, red, and green. Yeah? And, and while this is nice, you, you cannot simply go over the entire genome by eye and just screen them. So you will need uh, models to infer this, of course, then, then it gets nice. You can actually, it's more applicable to do it. So in here are our pi the pipelines that we're using for training the models. Our, our models are this, these are neural networks that later understand the different footprints and hopefully gives us an idea about how the how we can distinguish the modifications or how we can pick them up genome wide. Yeah. So this is the normal pipeline that is provided by Nanopore already. So you, after sequencing, you can we can do a demultiplexing. Uh, here we need to do two model trainings actually, because the raw signal first needs to be translated in a genetic, genetic sequence. Um, and only then we can also have a second model training that later here using Remora that later understands the modification and infers, uh, infers the percentages on genome wide. Um, while for PegBio, there's no, I think there's no pipeline from PegBio, correct me if I'm wrong, but we're using the tool CCS Math, which is um, um, from, can you, you can find it on GitHub. And when we do that, we, 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 see, we can also measure the accuracy. So you see here the different rounds of training we are doing. And uh, yeah, so the different models we have trained for this. So and why we have this, I wanted to highlight these two models for PacBio. I also need to say that we here we use the old chemistry from Nanopore. So I'm pretty sure this is much better now. And I think you showed yesterday that you are now with the accuracy for methyl cytosine at 99.7%. So this here is the old chemistry uh, with the R9 4.1 flow set. So I'm not sure how this how this correlates, but I'm, I'm happy to discuss this. So when we do the, methyl, uh, the, the training for methyl cytosine, you see that we get a certain accuracy for methyl cytosine using nanopore of um, 92%. Uh, we don't get any better when we introduce the the, uh, our modification here or the change in the methyl cytosine. And for, for PEG-Bio, however, when we train a model for methyl cytosine, we are at 94% accuracy. And if we do our, apply our azomagnetic approach, we can go up to 98.4 uh, accuracy. So which would be indicated here by the red line. Okay. so. What I also want to show you is how we approach the sequencing of formal cytosine. And please keep in mind that um, it's not so easy to make a reference genome that contains formal cytosine. The only way we can do it at the moment is by PCR. So that means we have only four, uh, four positions in the entire genome that also explains the, the missing error bars here or the, the missing distribution. If we would go genome wide, of course, it would not that be clean of a signal. But what I want to show you is that we have a chemistry in place and we're using a specific form of hydroxylamine that we developed to, together with Thomas Carell um, that increases the IPD of formal cytosine up to yeah, almost 10, so it's around nine point something. And, and this is a signal, actually, this is strong enough. You probably would uh, can also pick it up with, with even out the model, but let's see about that. So um, you can also look a little bit deeper into that and this is probably not the nicest way of showing this, this distribution or this increase in, in the kinetics, but I had, didn't have, this is really new data, so I didn't have time to change that. 
So each row here is, is one sequence that we're looking at. So one CG sequence with additional base at the downstream. And you see these, these um, profiles cluster together and you see that here in, within these areas, you have an increase in the IPD values. And this is exactly where our modification sits. Um, so is it here. And on the other hand, we have the second parameter yeah, that, that I introduced, which is the PW, so the pulse width. And this is actually normally not giving such a unique profile, but in our case, we can nicely pick it up also when we introduce our chemical reaction, so this hydroxylamine reaction. So I think this is a quite quite a nice um, step forward in measuring the hydroxy, uh, the pomocytosin. And uh, so what we do next is, of course, we want to combine these two um, techniques, right? So we have a little bit more sensitivity now on the Pekbawi machine for methylcytosin, and also the, the profile of methylcytosin became more unique for us. We now can combine this in, in a model that understands the difference between methylcytosin and formalcytosin so that we can measure them together on the same level. This is a model we are currently training. We have also now a, a more complex training set for formalcytosin. And because this is, I think, maybe this is something for PEG-Bio and, and Nanopore, because now PEG-Bio is doing it by default. They're measuring both DNA strands, right? But this information is at the moment neglected. Um, now with the duplex reads from Nanopore, you could potentially also look into symmetry of DNA methylation. And I believe that this might be very interesting if you have fast dividing cells like cancer, you might pick up profiles that you would not find in a normal somatic cell. You know? I'm not sure about it, but here's the theory. And um, so this is how we usually visualize our data. It was a profile uh, file structure that we developed in, in Saarbrücken, so with my colleague Karl Nordström, where we, I, when we were still doing our PhD uh, in Jörn's lab. So we call it a double strand information file. And here you basically can visualize four different states. Um, as you have seen in the beginning of hairpin biosulfide sequencing, because it was developed for genome-wide hairpin biosulfide sequencing, but potentially you can use this file format to um, get any type of four states visualization. And we have now also tools developed to, I mean, convert the PEG bio reads into these uh, kinetic or uh, dynamic, more dynamic profile formats. Okay, with this, uh, I just want to end. I want to thank my, my team. Uh, our collaboration partners, Thomas and Thomas Gorell's group and Jörn Walter, and, and of course our funding partners. And please feel free to take a question. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Pascal. Are there questions for the time for one or two short questions? Thanks for Pascal. I'm not into the literature, uh, but uh, 5FC and 5PC is AC. Are they playing any biological role or are this only oxidation products? From yes, good question. That is exactly what we also want to understand. I think the literature is very weak when it comes to this. Um, there is evidence that formal cytosine, for example, can stall polymerases because it forms a, a shift base uh, with the proteins and the same way it can also theoretically interact with histones. So it might impact chromatin folding, chromatin structure um, and also transcription. But because picking it up is, is very difficult, there is very little known. Yeah. A carboxycytosin is even more com complicated because it's very rare. So I would say this is just really a transient state that you want to get rid of as soon as possible, but yeah. Yes, thanks. Really great for the uh, inspiring work. Um, I have a question regarding the benchmark of the combined signal in the end when you're combining the six pad lay and the other yeah. types and one uh, yeah. DNA strand. Um, so, do you have an idea of how to get to ground roots? Because yeah, it's we, good... we essentially ran into a signal thing and <laughs> that led up to switching how to include the padding or the goes yeah. for the exam and at least. How yeah, do you it, it's a good. Sorry. Yeah, sorry, uh, it's a good question. Um, we're still working also on the benchmarking a little bit. So what we do, we have very clean genomes. So when we generate these genomes, we always digest it down to nucleoside level, and then we run a mass spec. So we know exactly, we can quantify precisely 
how much methyl cytosin there is. We know exactly how many CPG positions we have due to se uh, sequencing. So our benchmarking, how good our chemistry works is done by mass spec. It is also how we confirm that our methyl, low, uh, methyl genomes are 99.9% .9 methylated. And then of course we feed this, I mean, you have the pipeline nicely with this Remora infer um, part where you, where you can take the model genomes and say, these positions are methylated, these are not methylated, and this is something else. And then we just run it through this pipeline. And, and then it's, I don't know how, how good this pipeline is in inferring, but this is what we came up with. Um, of course, we're also working that because now we're using different combinations of methyl transferases so that we have in the same molecule, different types of modifications. Yeah? So because we think this is a better benchmarking and let us understand how also how the signal looks like if you have these uh, modifications in the neighborhood, right? This is important because it probably will change the profiles again. Yeah. Okay, so thank you very much. I think we have to move on and start will be available in the the break if you have additional questions. Thanks a lot for the time. Thank you. So the next talk is a recorded talk and I will um, just uh, share it with you. It's by uh, Bekim Sadikovic. He's based in Canada, so unfortunately he was not able to make it, but he was uh, nice enough to record this for us. And well, let me see. Oh, I'm happy to get help from Hannah. Thanks. <laughs> Oh no, so follow on. Can we fix the audio? Um. So the audio. So the audio. Is it recorded? Yeah. Yeah, don't worry. Um, I can't see the mouse. Another technical problem. I'm very sorry. I will ruin your coffee break. But yeah, hopefully ready to start soon. Hello, everyone. I'd like to thank the organizers for inviting me and express my regrets for not being able to be there in person. Uh, the title of my talk today is Evaluation of DNA Methylation Signatures in Neurodevelopmental Disorders. I do have a disclosure. Epigenase is a study of heritable changes in gene expression uh, or cellular phenotypes caused by mechanisms other than changes in the underlying DNA sequence. And as you'll see in this talk, uh, perhaps it doesn't necessarily apply exactly to the work that I'm going to present because a lot of the epigenetic changes that I'm going to be describing are actually direct result of the underpinning uh, genetic changes. Uh, epigenetic changes, unlike genetic changes, are uh, can be environmental responsive and uh, plastic or reversible. When we uh, talk about epigenetics, two of the more commonly studied mechanisms are histomodifications and DNA methylation. They both uh, act at the level of nucleosome, 
and they form uh, they enable formation of chromatin and chromosomes ultimately. Uh, most of the rest of my talk is going to focus on uh, DNA methylation specifically, which is the addition of a methyl group uh, to a fifth position of a cytosine by a methyl transferase enzyme. DNA methylation plays an important role in uh, chromatin regulation. As I mentioned, euchromatin tends to be associated with unmethylated DNA and oftentimes hyperacetylated histones, and the opposite is true for the heterochromatin or the transcriptionally inaccessible uh, DNA. One thing that's important to note uh, when we talk about epigenetics, in particular in clinical setting, is that DNA methylation patterns are uh, significantly different across different tissue types. As a matter of fact, that's part of the reason why uh, the, the different tissues are different. Uh, so when we think about using epigenetics and DNA methylation, uh, we have to uh, think about developing reference data sets that are tissue specific. The work that I'm going to present today uh, uses primarily EPIC methylation arrays. There are different ways to generate genome-wide methylation data. Uh, the current EPIC arrays uh, cover about 850,000 probes and are spread across the uh, majority of the human genes, including uh, gene regulatory regions like CPG islands. I will start by defining uh, what an EPI signature is. We define it as a recurrent epigenomic pattern associated with a common genetic or environmental etiology in a specific patient population. Uh, the way uh, that we generally derive an EPI signature is we start with a patient cohort uh, with a common genotype, phenotype, or specific environmental exposure. I'll mention that uh, in, in a bit uh, later on in the talk. Um, generally, we need about 10 to 20, 20 samples to initiate the analysis. Um, the analysis is performed in peripheral blood, and uh, DNA methylation epi signature generally is a portion of the genome-wide methylation profile that may be detected, de detectable in some of these uh, conditions. Uh, we use sophisticated um, analytic processes, including uh, development of specific classification algorithms uh, based on uh, uh, support vector machine or machine learning uh, uh, techniques uh, using uh, various clustering techniques. It's heavily reliant on the large reference database known as EpiSign Knowledge Database that's housed uh, uh, in our lab. First evidence uh, for an Epi signature came from an early study that looked at genome-wide methylation profiles in patients that had previously undergone microarray copy number testing. And uh, we seen uh, a couple of patients whose DNA methylation profile deviated from the reference uh, samples of about a couple of hundred other individuals. As you can see on this map here at three different regions, there's two lines that deviate. One of the patients uh, had SOTOS NSD1 mutation, the other one was a newborn, and uh, we did not have a genetic diagnosis at the time. We followed up, and lo and behold, we found an NSD1 mutation, which indicated for the first time that we perhaps are able to infer underpinning genetic condition based on the DNA methylation profile. Since then, we've gone on to um, do a lot of work in this space. We focused initially on chromatin regulatory uh, uh, genes uh, for these disorders referred to as chromatinopathies. Uh, uh, but certainly, uh, over time, we've expanded and uh, we have methylation signatures in mitochondrial conditions, neuromuscular conditions, epilepsy, uh, et cetera. Uh, so at the moment, there are close to 150 different DNA methylation profiles mapped. Um, about 120 of them are in um, the clinical EpiSign classifier, and I'll talk a little bit about it. Uh, one of the key parameters we look at is, uh, as I mentioned, is methylation variant pathogenicity score. Uh, when we uh, screen patients using this multi-class classifier, uh, they tend to be highly sensitive and specific. Uh, on the left side, we're showing you an example of an ATRX-specific MVP score. So each one of the dots is in the individual patient with ATRX, and the other uh, uh, columns uh, represent patients with other genetic conditions, so demonstrating high level of both sensitivity and specificity. Um, we also uh, know that uh, many of these EPI signatures are not necessarily gene-specific, so we now have strong evidence for many different protein complexes sharing a common DNA methylation signature. This is from some of the earlier work um, that we sh where we've shown um, evidence of a common DNA methylation profile or EPI signature for bifopathy or SWE-SNP remodeling complex signatures that involve a number of different genes uh, in, in, involved in uh, uh, conditions uh, like Coffin Cyrus uh, type 1, type 3, Nicolaitis Baratzer syndrome. Of course, over time, we've expanded this database, and we now have evidence of sub-signatures that allow us not only to pinpoint that there's a specific protein complex involved, but down to a specific gene level. 
The opposite is also true. We now have evidence for DNA methylation signatures for subgene level, so certain protein domains, even certain amino acids, sometimes specifically associated with clinical subtypes and clinical phenotypes. Um, epi signatures have been uh, shown to be quite valuable in uh, defining uh, new syndromes. So there's been many publications now that uh, use epi signatures um, to uh, define a common etiology for a newly de described uh, uh, genetic disorder um, as uh, uh, essentially <coughs> common, uh, evidence for a common uh, molecular etiology. Uh, we are looking at well-known diseases like uh, copy number alterations as well. So we've now mapped epi signatures in uh, close to 20 different micro deletion and duplication syndromes. Uh, you might ask yourself, why would we care? Because we can detect these you know, conditions using CMV uh, testing simply. Uh, because we can sometimes infer additional information. In some cases, it allows us to pinpoint down to specific genes with these, within these micro deletion duplication regions that are the culprits, that are the genes that are positive for DNA methylation. Uh, signature, sometimes uh, we can also infer specific clinical subtypes based on presence or absence of um, epi signatures. And then also, of course, looking at genome-wide methylation changes allows us to uh, infer which genes or gene pathways may be disrupted downstream from the micro deletion or duplication syndrome. Um, the key clinical utility for use of these epi signatures in rare disorders is because they allow us to functionally assess the impact of a genetic variant um, at a protein level, essentially, um, in the same DNA sample from which we've done the testing. So uh, uh, we've demonstrated that um, these methylation signatures uh, allow us to uh, reclassify uh, what are variants of unknown clinical significance quite effectively in a growing number of diseases. Um, because it is a multi-class classifier, we're able to screen for these conditions all uh, at the same time simultaneously. And oftentimes, uh, clinicians may uh, not be able to tell very specifically which uh, condition a patient may have. Uh, when we do screening, we're able to detect uh, you know, alternate conditions. So I'm just showing as an example here uh, on the top panel, there's a number of patients uh, in this particular paper that screen for chart using the methylation classifier. There's four dots uh, showing uh, that four of these individuals had charge. That signature number of dots on the right-hand side are individuals that did not have any of the signatures on this panel. And on the left-hand side, one of the individuals that was uh, assessed for charge, query charge, actually had an ADMP signature. And subsequent reassessment of exomes in this particular case found that patient actually carried a mutation that was uh, a complex that was missed by exomes originally that actually, you know, was uh, the cause of the actually ADMP-related uh, syndrome in, in this particular patient. So we've seen many patients like that uh, since. We're also able to um, use uh, these epi signatures to screen patients that are otherwise genetically unresolved. So many patients undergo extensive genomic testing, such as, you know, data sequencing, genome sequencing, trios, and so on, are often not solved. So we've uh, published many papers now where we take these patients and uh, assess them using methylation profiling. We ultimately find subsets of them to have epi signatures, and then um, those patients are then able to be more detail, uh, interrogated more detail, often, um, you know, allowing us to find genetic variants that may be there buried uh, deep in tronic or regulatory elements and so on. There are patients, however, who have distinct clinical features. We have an epi signature, but genetic variant is never found. And uh, for those uh, patients, epi signature uh, uh, tends to be the only molecular evidence for, uh, um, uh, for, for their condition. So as a result of uh, these advances about three years ago now, 2004 years ago now, 2019, we launched what was um, the uh, the first uh, DNA methylation uh, assay uh, for uh, clinical labs in a clinical setting. A uh, number of labs uh, had adopted it early on and uh, uh, essentially used it primarily for reclassification of variants of unknown clinical significance and in some cases for screening patients. So early after we um, Sorry, I should mention this slide here. So that test has expanded, you know, first test only at about a dozen or so, analyzed the current epi version 5 that's uh, launching in the next uh, week or a couple of weeks uh, through the clinical network. We just finalized the validations on that uh, uh, set. It has about 120, 126 uh, different uh, genes uh, and over 100 different epi signatures uh, that are uh, associated with uh, 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 over 100 different uh, genetic conditions. When we started doing epi signature testing clinically through the network, uh, we also looked at initially, uh, you know, what's the diagnostic impact, the yield positivity rate. So we looked at the first couple of hundred patients. This is back about, you know, two, three years ago now, and uh, demonstrated very nicely. There's about 
30%, 35% positivity rate, uh, uh, the diagnostic yield in the patients that were tested. Um, and uh, they were subset in the patients that had previous VUSs, so about 35% of those um, had uh, positive FP signature, and then about 70 patients that did not have previous uh, genetic findings, 11% of them actually, actually had an FP signature. In some of these cases, it allowed us then subsequently identify uh, specific genetic uh, variants. So fast forward uh, you know, a couple of years, uh, we've just uh, completed a summary of about uh, close to 3,000 patients uh, uh, tested uh, by the end of 2022 through the EpiSign Clinical Network. And uh, of course, the, um, the, the test uh, um, has expanded to a large number of conditions um, and uh, the utilization has broadened. Uh, we've seen significant, you know, significant increase in volume of the testing as the adoption is, has expanded. Um, and, but we are still keeping a similar positivity rate, about 32% of patients uh, for targeted testing. So few VUS reclassification, about 20% of EpiSign complete is oftentimes patients that don't have a previous genetic finding or we're finding distinct DNA methylation signatures. Um, this should be out uh, in genetics and medicine soon. Um, part of um, developing new uh, clinical tests uh, oftentimes requires um, health system impact assessment, uh, you know, different health regulatory requires this information, so which patients should be tested under which circumstances. So in Canada, currently we're running a health system study called EpiSign Can. We're testing thousands of patients through 14 sites nationally as either a tier one test, so at the initial diagnostic workup, or a tier two post uh, genomic, uh, a significant genomic assessment. And we're seeing uh, a significant diagnostic yield coming through to that study. So by the end of the study, will be able to match the diagnostic yield to also health system impact. So which patients benefit, benefit under which circumstances, did they get access to care, changes to access to care, um, uh, you know, what was there change in the downstream diagnostic path pathways and so on. There are a number of international studies that we're also running uh, in Australia where uh, uh, we initially, initially started focused on uh, epilepsies, uh, working with Dean Schaefer and Heather Mefford and Mike Hindebrand in UK, uh, we recently completed uh, a, a study uh, focused on developing uh, evidence uh, for the national health uh, system in the UK, and uh, uh, EpiSign test uh, has now been approved by the National Health, uh, health uh, Test Registry in UK. It's going to become uh, available uh, routinely clinically through the Manchester lab. We are running a study uh, now or participating in a project in Germany uh, with Parker Schauger focused on mitochondria called GenoMIT. We're trying to map methylation uh, signatures for mitochondrial disorders in collaboration with a number of European collaborators. And we are uh, about to launch or just actually launched this uh, EpiSign International study. It's, it's a Genome Canada funded study. It's just about to be announced. And it's a very ambitious effort uh, involving 14 countries and a large number of labs where we're going to be implementing uh, uh, EpiSign testing uh, along with some new hardware that we're developing with an industry partner uh, as well as some automated software. Um, so I'll talk a little bit more about it a um, few slides down, down the line. Um, a lot of this work really uh, continues to evolve. Uh, we're continuing to develop evidence for epi signatures. Uh, it truly is a global effort. Uh, currently, over 100 institutions in more than 20 countries have participated. We're actively looking to map methylation signatures in over 600 syndromes. We're looking to expand that to about 1,000 within the five years. So um, uh, as you may imagine, it does really take uh, take a village in this uh, field. Uh, it's where it's sort of space, so it requires a significant collaboration uh, for, from centers around the world to uh, you know collect substantial uh, number of samples to be able to do this. Um, again, this is really just a kind of a thank you slide. I asked one of my uh, uh, coordinators, uh, this was about two years ago now, just pulled some of the uh, uh, names from the papers of the people that are collaborated. Uh, it's by no means comprehensive list, but it really is a thank you to uh, to everyone that's uh, you know participated and continues to participate uh, in this work. So the EpiSign uh, continues to expand in clinical utility. We now have, uh, as I mentioned, uh, Epi signatures for 100 different disorders. We're expanding beyond genetics into teratogens. Uh, uh, we are looking at using Epi variant information clinically as well, so specific. Gene specific changes, so for example, hypermethylation of autosomal dominant gene, um, you know, causing perhaps a repression of that uh, expression of the gene that may be associated with the promoter specific uh, uh, regulatory elements and so on. And I'll tell you a little bit about EpiSign Metascore. So, beyond genetics, we've now mapped epi signatures for uh, specific prenatal exposures to teratogens. 
um, in this case, I'm showing you the feat of operate syndrome. Uh, so operate is given to women to control uh, seizures during preg pregnancies. About 8% of the kids uh, may be born with syndromic features as a re result of the prenatal exposure. Uh, we now have very uh, strong uh, uh, evidence of the uh, distinct DNA methylation epi signature in these kids. It's important to have a biomarker because oftentimes these kids go on to get significant genetic workup looking for evidence of a genetic defect that is not there to begin with. Um, another good example is fetal alcohol syndrome. So we've now repeated um, a third cohort uh, of, of data and, and showed that there is a reproducible DNA methylation signature in majority of patients who suspected fetal, uh, uh, fetal alcohol syndrome. And as a matter of fact, there is uh, evidence that seems to segregate patients that are uh, with stronger clinical features versus more mildly affected. And both of these studies uh, uh, we're just summarizing now. We should be uh, submitting them uh, shortly. Epi variants, as I mentioned here, um, so these are punctuate, so uh, uh, a puncture also local specific uh, methylation events, so hypermethylation of a gene promoter, for example, uh, where you can um, 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 infer possible causation. Um, um, it, and uh, we are trying to kind of get to a point where we can uh, systematically assess these. We now tested well, 20,000 patients, and we're trying to get you know, kind of population frequencies uh, for these type of events before we get into a uh, a point where we'll be able to uh, report them um, as, as possible additional etiology for some of these genetic disorders. We expect that these, that most of these events are actually happening as a result of in cis genetic variation, perhaps promoter specific genetic variation that's really hard to assess by um, genome or exome sequences, uh, sequence analysis. Epicymeta score, so we're trying to automate the software. So currently, a lot of this work is done uh, through our lab. Uh, so we are a data repository, also data analytics uh, site for a lot of this work. Uh, um, we are trying to develop uh, uh, some automated software that will combine um, a lot of the algorithms that are used for epicyme analysis, essentially, and uh, uh, build them into a empirical reference data set that would allow any sample uh, that is tested by any site around the world to be matched against various parameters into what we're calling an epicymeta score. So essentially automation for DNA methylation epi signature calling. We expect we'll be able to do this for a majority of the samples. Perhaps there will still be some that will need deeper dives, if you will, but that's what we're working toward. And the reason why we want to work on that is because we are now developing an integrated copy number methylation array. We've partnered with Illumina, um, and I'll mention on the next couple of slides. Uh, but the, the reason why we want to do that is because initial diagnostic tests for a significant proportion of patients with the DDNID globally um, undergoes copy number assessment through a microarray test. If we're able to combine methylation analysis on top of that, we'll be able to then, of course, uh, call copy number alterations along with things like uh, imprinting disorders, fragile X, and all the epi signature conditions. Um, so this is the project that I just mentioned here. So we are uh, uh, currently uh, uh, in the process of setting up the network. Uh, the project will last about three years. We will be uh, testing out this integrated copy number methylation array through a uh, number of labs around the world. Uh, if anyone's interested to reach out to me, we are, we are still, still, ex still expanding the network. We're able to add on additional labs uh, if anyone's interested. Um, and uh, ultimately, we're also going to be testing out the software um, that is ultimately going to be um, on the um, uh, on the cloud interface for uh, the, the data analytics component. And finally, you know what what I think is uh, is the goal. What well, the goal is to get to a point where we're eventually going to be able to assess methylation profiles simultaneously with uh, genetic assessment. I do do believe it's going to be useful, uh, both um, you know as a screen, but also um, as an uh, as a test to augment genomic or, or genomic sequencing approaches. And finally, last couple of slides, I just want to mention, I don't want to go too deep into this, but of course, I focus, you know, most of my talk thus far on the use of methylation profiles as uh, diagnostic biomarkers. There's broader potential for use, including for assessment of functional impact of, of these methylation changes. So we know now that these methylation profiles are uh, shared across uh, many of these uh, neurodevelopmental conditions. Uh, the overlap of sharing uh, of these methylation changes allows us to start building maps of the relatedness of these conditions. Um, and, and why is that important is because we think that uh, we, we have shown the methylation, these methylation changes are strongly enriched in CPG islands and gene promoters uh, and neurodevelopmental networks. Uh, the question is, uh, are, are there shared methylation signatures across phenotypes or clinical presentations? Uh, uh, are there shared uh, methylation signatures across human phenotype ontologies? 
Uh, can we use this information to start thinking about developing uh, you know, therapies that may target uh, potentially reversible epigenomic changes and so on? And with this, I'm going to close my talk uh, uh, with, the, with the controversial, quote unquote, controversial proposition, and that is that genome is not the most uh, unique code of life, uh, and that epigenome is a reflection of the DNA code in a spatial and temporal context is a much more specific and accurate code of, code, code of life. And of course, I wasn't the first uh, person to come up with this uh, theory, uh, a gentleman named Heraclitus, a Greek philosopher, about two and a half thousand years ago, has said that no man ever steps in the same river twice, for it's not the same river, and he's not the same man. And with that, I thank you all for your attention, and certainly Tech by Lab for all the hard work you've been uh, doing over the last uh, decade, really, in the space, and uh, continue to develop it. Uh, thank you very much. Yeah, okay. Uh, maybe just a short comment. I really like the idea, the approach of Bacon, because it also shows that this might be or is another level of complexity, which is added to the genome. And it uh, is also, also very, very helpful, helpful in making diagnosis using it as a decision making tool, even if you see the profile or, or the other hand if you have a variant of unknown significance and then you can correlate it with the AP signature so yeah um, so we move on to the next speaker Wolfgang Wagner from Aachen so he's professor in stem cell biology and I'm very happy Wolfgang that you made it today to come to Bonn Right, we're set. Thanks, Ingo, for having me here. So I'd like to use this opportunity to talk with you about um, a project where we are using DNA methylation for deconvolution of different leukocyte subtypes. And I must say, I feel a bit embarrassed to talk in front of this audience because in contrast to all these high-end sequencing approaches, we are really trying to make it as simple as possible. And um, here, here is my disclosure. So we have a very small spin-off company that can provide service, but but more importantly, we have uh, our faculty holds a couple of patents and patents applications, and we're currently trying to get some some funding for exist to 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 drive this further than towards a clinical application. So just briefly for leukocyte cell counts, you may know that this is quite easy and standard in, in, in clinics, right? Usually you use uh, the, these automated cell counters. You can classify the cells by morphology with more or less semi-automated. Uh, um, microscopy, but if you really want to have a look for the different leukocyte subtypes, like the different subsets of T cells or B cells, then they need to have flow cytometry, which is still quite labor intensive and not so easy to standardize. And either way, all of these methods need fresh blood. So it's not feasible with frozen or, or, or dried blood spots. So this is where our approach would be useful. We need very little amount of blood, of course, and as I said, it can even be frozen. Um, then we do DNA isolation, bisulfit conversion, and and in contrast to what we just heard, we really want to identify very very few sites in the genome um, that we then use for our targeted DNA methylation analysis. So we have a PCR and then then some kind of measure for DNA methylation and then data analysis. Um, and the deconvolution of leukocyte subtypes was not really pioneered in our group. There were, I think it was particularly around uh, Eugen Hausmann's um, um, work that they used the Illumina B chip data um, to see that there are really significant differences in the DNA methylome of the different leukocyte subsets. And they identified a bunch of CBGs that are then differentially methylated and integrating hundreds of these CBGs with a, a non-negative least square model, you could have a deconvolution approach and you can see that this works fairly well on artificial mixtures of different cell types. You can see that they expected and the, and the observed um, um, a combination of different subsets works quite nice. So, um, so this, as I said, was based on Illumina B-chip data. And we're also using this platform. It's, it's fantastic to integrate all this. Um, and, and, and we heard about all these different these different versions here that are coming up. I think the gold standard still is whole genome biospec sequencing. You get, of course, a lot of information, 
you need also high coverage. It's, it's also quite quite cost intensive. And we heard all, about all these other sequencing approaches, but just want to make the point here, although I share the enthusiasm for research, it's very difficult to really apply this for simple clinical application because first of all, time and cost of course is an issue. Even if Helene yesterday said that it's feasible within one hour, I think it's still a challenge to do for most of us to do this in this in this time frame. Um, in a lot of bioinformatics, and uh, keep in time, uh, keep you have to acknowledge that also the bioinformatics and the and the programs need to be approved for clinical application later on, which is really not so easy, particularly given that, for example, the Illumina B chip platforms are changing all over the place, and then if you have a nice signature. With the next release of the platform, it may be quite difficult to implement this further. Standardization certainly is an issue, and data protection, if you have whole genome data, is also, I think, uh, more and more becoming a critical issue. And more, most important, maybe, many of these platforms are simply not certified for a clinical application. So for real clinical use, they are not suitable. So this is why we thought we need to make this more simple. Let's go for very few CPGs and let's use very, very simple analysis approaches. Initially, we used virus sequencing a lot because by the time this was um, claimed to be the most sensitive and the most precise you know, methylation measure on individual CPGs. And, and you can see here we, we used a lot uh, epigenetic tox, and then you can see if we implement various of them here, in this case, nine CPGs, we get very good results. And this still works nice, but also PIRA sequencing is not CE certified. So more recently, we're using the digital droplet PCR, and we are also using Bicevit um, barcoded amplicon sequencing. But here also, the, the setting of the primers is not so easy, and you still need to have a lot of bioinformatics. So it is still a challenge for us and not so easy to implement. So here I want to particularly focus on the first two methods. And already six years ago, we are tried to identify by the by the time available Illumina B chip data, individual CPGs depicted here. So it's just individual CPGs now for each of these cell types that are specifically hypermethylated in one or the other subset of leukocytes. And if we integrate now this by the time still with a non-negatively square model, we could see that we can very nice predict the relative composition of these leukocytes. So you can see here that this correlates very well with the convention of blood counts and in, in, in cell counters or here with flow cytometry measurements even of the cell subsets. Didn't work for all of the subsets so nice here, but overall I think it's, it was a nice proof of principle that with these very simple targeted approaches for denomethylation at individual sites, we could get a fairly good prediction of the, of the leukocyte subsets. And more recently we then Benchmark this on larger cohorts on healthy patients and also on, on, on patients with hematologic diseases. You can see that while for healthy patients it usually works quite nice, there is a bigger offset for several patients, particularly if they have leukemias. Now keep in mind that maybe in the leukemias also the conventional counts may be fraud in a way, but um, but anyway, we can see that there is some aberrations if you just sum up the, the estimates for the different subsets and we would see that they wouldn't sum up to 100%. So, so I think there is also some advantage to depict samples that don't have a normal composition of, of leukocyte subsets. We've also benchmarked this with um, conventional round robin tests. And um, you can see here that overall our predictions, I think, performed already by the time here quite well. Um, I just want to indicate this here because it also depicts that even with the conventional blood counts, there's a huge offset between different cell counters. And we can see this even in our faculty that depending on which machine we measure, we can completely different results. And that of course is important because this is what we're training our, our estimates on. So, um, so I think uh, the, the perception that this is all established and gives precise measures is not so much the case if you look a little deeper and compare across different studies. Now, of course, we wanted to further improve this. And one approach was that we very recently took the meanwhile available Illumina VChip data set. So this is now a collection from 40 different studies and more than, more than 1,300 sorted subsets. And based on this much larger cohort of Illumina VChip data, we now looked again for the better individual CPGs for these subsets. And we also used an, a tool that we developed together with a group of Ivan Costa in our faculty. It's called Simple G, and again, thought to make very simple predictions, basically on the 
mean between the average denimethylation differences between the groups and the sum of the variances in the individual groups. And then there is some training and then that for identifying the, the most um, suitable individual CPG. And this is what we came up with then. These are for each of these cell types, we found then three CPGs that have a characteristic denimethylation pattern. And we tested this now, not with pyrus sequencing, but with the digital droplet PCR, which in our hands gave a little more precise measures or at least better correlations with the conventional blood counts, maybe because the PCI bias is neglectable here because we are measuring in these individual droplets and get basically a yes or no for each of these um for the uh, either each of these patterns and and by the way we also now simply use a linear regression model so it's a very very simple procedure and we can even measure now individual subsets since we are only having a linear model for each of these individual cpgs and you can see that and and this and this patient validation cohort here this works quite nice so we have now a very good correlation for almost all of these subsets between the conventional cell counts and um, and the digital droplet measurements um, on individual CPGs. This was relative quantification. Of course, it's important for clinicians to know the absolute number of cell counts. And to do that, we invented a method where we have spiked our DNA with a reference plasmid. Of course, digital PCR is quantitative already in a way, but, but there may be big differences between the cell preparations and the DNA isolation methods, particularly if you do this from, from dry blood spots. And this is why we are spiking this with a reference plasma to get a little more precise um, measurement for the quantitative assessment. You can see this overall correlates also quite well. And of course, the challenge now is to really have this for dry blood spots, because this is a big advantage for our method. If you have a HIV patient who wants to check his CD4, CD8 counts, they maybe don't want to go to the to the practitioner all the time. So that this, this is now a very simple procedure where they could just have a simple blood spot they could self-harvest without any, any clinical uh, personnel. And then ship this dried blood uh, to to a service um, um, the, uh, a company that then measures the DNA methylation, uh, spikes this with the reference plasma, of course, um, and then gets absolute cell counts. And and here's a proof of principle that this really worked quite okay. So if we do this with Wagner paper, we get fairly good estimates for the relative composition and the absolute composition of leukocyte counts. We are also trying to establish this for hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells, since um, our institutes particularly focus on stem cells, of course, but also since there may be a need for uh, for transplantation settings to use whether mobilization arrangement is sufficient and whether um, maybe in the transplant we have enough of these stem stem and progenitor cells. Mm -hmm. And again, we found, of course, a number of uh, DNA methylation changes in in the subsets. Um, However, these cells, these cell fractions are very small, even mobilized blood. And therefore the correlations were not really good. And I think as it stands, it is not really applicable for clinical application for these very small subsets. Having said that, leukemia starts from hematopoietic stem and progenitor cells. And we found a very good correlation in blasts in AML with many of these, of these um, uh, uh, Hematopoietic DNA methylation changes that we see in hematopoietic staminal progenitor cells. So actually, here fantastic correlation with the real blast counts of our DNA methylation site, which of course needs to be further validated. But I feel that maybe, maybe that some of these aberrations in leukemia we can track by looking for what is specific in hematopoietic staminal progenitor cells. And I want to briefly pitch on it different project, at least also related with blood counts or, or blood cells here, we're, we're analyzing CAR T cells. So this is a cell product that's now used a lot in the clinics. And these T cell products need to be culture expanded for a while. And we, we looked a lot for how DNA methylation changes in cells and culture. And of course, also here in the T cells, we can see a lot of DNA methylation changes. We can track very precisely how long cells were cultured if we implement a smaller signature of uh, DNA methylation changes. And what's intriguing is that even if the cells were cultured for the same time, the therapeutic outcome of these CAR T cell products seems to correlate with our long-term culture signatures, indicating that perhaps the exhaustion that we can already drive during in vitro expansion is continued in vivo. That's something that we'd like to pursue also in the future. 
So that's what I wanted to share with you. I hope I could convince you that, well, I think we didn't need to because this audience is well aware that denomethylation is a fantastic biomarker for many um, kinds, of, kinds of measurements like quality control of soils aging or to determine the cellular composition of soils. I, and, and here, I hope I can convince you maybe a little more. If you want to really bring this to the clinic, it needs to be simple. And um, and I think we have proof of concept that this works for leukocyte cell counts and may even facilitate cell testing in the future. So many people I want to thank, of course, from fantastic team from from our group, but also many collaborations from hematology, immunology, transfusion medicine, and also even Costa's team from computational biology. And for the CAR T cell study I mentioned briefly, we have a very good collaboration with Miltony and with uh, Manelis Taylor's group in Barcelona. Um, we got funding from the Elsa Corona Fazini Stiftung in particular and from a VRP Plus project. Thank you for your attention. Very interesting. So, um, very simple question. How crucial is it that the material that the blood has come from in, in a routine setting quite quickly from? from the patient to, to the lab, is this not a problem? Well, we, we put the right blood spot, we, we tested after, after seven days or more. We haven't systematically looked for how long we can have it on the filter paper, but I think other people used the gut recounts after decades and it still worked. And and we are using frozen material um, also that the harvest decades ago. So I think this is not an issue here. In, uh, in the ALL patients, that population, the can you identify the So, sorry, I didn't quite hear. So, we have that population from the So, we get them on a strong stem bicycle group. Um, you can be stem cells in the group. Can you identify that on the population? So, the question is whether uh, for the AML, the name of the sensor, I still didn't get it. I'm sorry. So, so the epigenetics right, um, of the blast population, can you identify a stem-like signature from the blast population so you can identify? Yeah, yeah. So I, in, in fact, we do have a, a project on an AML to, to look further. Um, more to see whether we can use that for minimal disease, disease tracking because there are these aberrant uh, changes. I think in general, it is observed that many of these aberrations we see in AML are related to hematuritic seminal progenitor cells, but it's not quite the same. So we, there are certainly very specific differences. So it's not that simple that the aberrations that we have in AML are simply reflecting what we have in hematuritic seminal progenitor cells. That's what you're pointing at. And you can also very nicely subtract the different subsets of AMR. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks. So the next talk is an industry talk given by Twist uh, Bioscience uh, by Jochen Segewis and Oliver Latz. Huh? Yeah, just show your screen. Yeah. Good morning. So I'm uh, Oliver Latz from Twist Bioscience, and uh, I'm have the goal to show you a bit how we can approach uh, methylation, how can we can better it from a practical side. And uh, why, why I'm focusing on is that we are offering really a very flexible solution for methylation detection, a custom, a customizable solution, which can start from as few uh, CPGs you want up to 4 million CPGs. And uh, I would like to try to start with a general short introduction uh, about twists, just to show you the principle we have. 
our principle at twist is really to change the way synthetic DNA is synthesized. And uh, from the current standard, which is, uh, let's say, uh, with 96 well plates with one gene or one oligo, we have uh, scaled it up and can produce one million oligos in one synthesis run. And uh, we print our oligos on a scaled, on a very uh, high throughput uh, system, scaled down in femtomol uh, um, yield, and are able to make one million oligos in one synthesis run. And this allows us to be very fast and to offer really customized high quality solutions for this. In, in the uh, beginning, we were uh, starting as a synthetic biology company with uh, synthetic genes, oligo pools, uh, variant libraries for uh, antibody development. But then in 2018, we started with uh, targeted enrichment and uh, uh, really approaching genetic um, human geneticists. Uh, one really important uh, part of our uh, workflow of our systems of sy synthesizing DNA is that we are really scaling down. We are using much less reagents, much less uh, really let's say difficult uh, uh, chemicals for the environment and the costs are much lower so the the price for um, for um, for the environment is much less here is a bit of a kind of uh, a comparison we produce one gene uh, which is uh, to synthesize which is really uh, analog to let's say 100 uh, uh, probes uh, costs around 600 times less energy or CO2 than um, than, than with uh, conventional methods. And uh, how is this principle working? So we are uh, not only synthesizing very uniform oligos on a, a silicon plate, but after the synthesis, we are amplifying it to produce double-stranded DNA probes. And in uh, in um, if we compare it to to other uh, um, providers, our uh, um, approach allows really to have a very uniform uh, uh, capturing, and this allows really for you to save uh, money and and, uh, and also costs for for sequencing because you have every everywhere a, a very um, um, uniform uh, representation of, of of targets. Okay. So this is just uh, just to show you um, to get a, a 30x uh, coverage of a, of a, a certain target. Uh, with us, you you can really you you can really balance it out. And um, why why is this uh, so good? What what's uh, so positive about us um, is that you can you are able really to customize uh, uh, your your workflow. You can. Uh, go in as deep coverage as you like and uh, really from a uh, few little targeted target regions to to very many targeted regions and this allows you really to customize your your workflow and to mm -hmm. to get what you want and not over sequence and spend too much time with that so just a short um, description so at first you have a, a the three main advantages as you have lower costs per sample because you synthesize less, you have uh, uh, less sequencing costs. You have a very rapid uh, customization. I mean, I can remember that from the past uh, when customers were um, thinking about ordering custom panels, they were always thinking, oh, it's going to take a lot of time. Design will take a lot of time. But with us, it's really something that uh, takes between two to four weeks uh, after the design is, uh, is accepted. Also, the throughput time in the lab is very fast. We have a fast hybridization protocol, which allows you to start from uh, some library preparation to the sequencing uh, to sequencing run in one day. So uh, this is where probably most of you know us as uh, uh, exome sequence or exome whole exome, and uh, just a short description of uh, really the advantages and. We started in about 2018 and were really uh, capable of uh, convincing customers to really try our system to to see it with their own eyes how much uh, they can they can win and gain with our system, and uh, we thought a lot how we can uh, really repeat this exercise and then 
we um, we, are, we started thinking about methylation detection. And uh, here we had a situation where you had on one side uh, a bisulfite uh, uh, conversion, which is a very good method, but could it be improved? Possibly yes. We uh, tested a long time and uh, then developed a cooperation with NAD and uh, uh, are using their enzymatic uh, targeted methylation um, library prep kit and combined this with an improved uh, targeted enrichment protocol uh, with our methylation enhancers and obviously our uh, twist custom probes. And uh, what's fascinating about our custom probes is that we are able to produce so much DNA so precisely, so fastly, that we produce uh, four uh, um, different types of probes. So for the methylated and for the unmethylated sample, and then obviously for the uh, leading strand and for the antisense strand. And uh, it took us really lots of time to, to, de to design, to optimize the design. And finally, uh, uh, of course, with machine learning and all and, and, and many advanced strategies, and finally we arrived to a, a methylome uh, from, from us. I would describe it a bit later. Just here a few words about the uh, the comparison of our uh, enzymatic protocol or NED's enzymatic protocol to bisulfite, um, which is uh, currently used by by most um, by most researchers. And uh, here it shows that after, um, in, in general, the, the conversion rate is much higher with the enzymatic system on one side. And on the other side, you can also gain, uh, um, you, you can really uh, get a, a much higher yield out of, the, um, out of the sample material, which you can also reach with a bisulfate, but only after a lot of uh, optimization. Um, also, regarding the sensitivity, sensitivity, we made a test with uh, four different uh, sorts of uh, of sample material, uh, from hemimethylated to uh, um, hypermethylated, and we could really see that with our uh, capture um, targeted enrichment system, we were able to have really uh, reproducible results, which was uh, which could be also shown. This is our methylome panel, which is really the counterpart of our exome panel. And it's really huge. Uh, we cover like uh, 6.5 million CPG sites with shadow coverage and uh, about 4 million uh, CPG sites with um, on, on target with 133 MB. And uh, it was taken from uh, the most well-known uh, databases. And uh, if you're interested, we can send you our bat files. And obviously, uh, you can also select a part of it and just focus on what's really of interest to you. I mean, this is really very large, but you can also really reduce it, customize it, and get it in about a few weeks. Um, there are really quite a few advantages of a microarray. So this is another part where we try also to see how uh, the current standard can be changed. Or, or can be uh, um, bettered. And uh, I mean, the, there's really a, a lot to say. For example, the SNP detection by analyze, 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 analyzing the opposite strand, um, really the, the flexibility is probably the biggest advantage. And uh, just come to us, talk to us, and uh, we have really a high, highly skilled team of uh, bioinformaticians and uh, uh, scientists who can really help you to uh, improve your design and that really try this out. And uh, just to um, put together what we have trying to offer is really an end-to-end -end solution where you can really go from the beginning to the end with a complete workflow that is optimized for uh, really um, focusing on what you want. And uh, just here, a comparison between the EPIC and our methylome panel. I mean, you see there's really lots of uh, uh, our, our methylome is really uh, covering much more. But of course, if you want to try, we can also design whatever part of, the, of, of what's interesting you. Uh, finally, also, the, we have a much increased uh, dynamic range and um, the detection from uh, with our NGS panel, with our uh, methylone panel compared to the epigray 
shows that there's more accuracy, especially at the at the um, both ends of the spectrum. So for the fully methylated and unmethylated parts. Yeah, and this is just the final slide. Uh, I, I think that uh, what I really wanted to show you is that with us, you have really um, the possibility possibility to customize everything and really to to do whatever you like uh, as you like. You are not uh, you are not dependent on 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 the content somebody is delivering to you, but you can really uh, go to us and design your customized. Uh, um, product. That's all. Thank you very much. So you showed that FFPE material is also uh, working on this. Do you have some data on that already? Or? Advantage of uh, of our system that uh, also for uh, specific specifically uh, CF uh, DNA everything that is sparse that is really difficult to 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 capture this is something where we are really specialized in and additional questions if you have done. Yes. Yeah, we, yes, uh, and we, you can always have a, a Zoom meeting with us, with our experts and uh, go into more detail. I mean, this was really about to, to show you what's, what's all possible, but uh, just call us. Thank you. Thanks a lot. And, and it's really worthwhile. I, they, they have great socks out there. So please check. <laughs> okay, so the next talk is uh, again an online talk. I hope this will uh, work uh, pretty well. Um, it's from Manuel Holkreve and uh, Vincent May from the Charité Berlin. And now we're switching a bit to structural variations and they will um, let us know about SV calling from uh, ONT data, benchmarks, and new approaches. So, um, okay, yeah, Manuel, hi. Uh, okay, uh, can you hear me? We can hear you. We don't see the slides, but now the sharing starts and looks perfect. Thanks for- Great, thank you. Good morning. Good morning. <laughs> Um, so this is joint work with uh, Vincenz um, and Dieter Beuler that I'm presenting, and I will talk about structure variant calling from um, Oxford Nanopore Long Read data, um, and uh, we'll talk about um, we're working on a new method for um, structure variant detection from long read data, and I will talk a bit about well challenges um, with with methods with uh, data with benchmarks that we were seeing when developing this method and the method as well. Um, so let's start. Um, so first of all, um, obviously, um, structural variation is uh, still challenging to detect and long reads um, hopefully can help us here a bit further. Um, so for example, um, here's um, a screenshot um, of uh, the, read, the read alignments of um, the, uh, the, 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 the genome of a child and uh, one of its parents. And you can see there's a lot of things going on here. Um, the long um, black lines, these are deletions um, in the sample with respect to the reference and um, these um, little, um, yeah, in case you don't know, these little um, um, uh, mountains here, this is the read coverage, whereas you have the reads below and you see a drop of coverage there. Um, and um, in the father or the mother, you, you clearly see a deletion of, say, uh, 260 base pairs. Um, whereas um, the child, um, yeah, also appears to have this deletion, but um, you will also see um, some insertions here um, marked by these um, violet spots. And um, what, what you can see on this picture, this region is most likely in the tandem repeat um, region. So there is um, one allele that is uh, shorter than in the reference, and um, this is shared with it between the child and the, the parent. And the child also has an allele that is um, longer than the reference and has insertions with respect to the reference. And um, yeah, well, 
it's it's um, as you can see the signal is not as clear as you would hope so you also see um, the, the deletion in the father is uh, split and it's not always in each read one big deletion this is just um, the reason is just that's the way the sequence of our genome is made up so everything you can see a signal and you can see these um, insertion and deletions um, and in particular with short read data you wouldn't have a chance of really detecting these things um, in a variable number tandem repeat regions but um, with long read data you, you have signal but um, it's not so easy to unravel it in in these cases um, so, and our approach is um, based on, um, yeah, constructing good consensus sequences of the uh, different alleles, aligning them back to the reference, and then um, you can see on the, the bottom, the consensus sequence, you clearly see um, the deletion, um, say, in the, in the second line um, of 260 base pairs, and you have a high quality consensus sequence, and from this you can do variant calling, and you have just have to obtain a good consensus. Um, that's that's our idea. So so yeah, we have already have some partial success. So we're not done yet, but uh, we we're on a good track, I would say. But uh, the data is a bit challenging. So um, when looking at the state of the art, there's a couple of methods out there. So first of all, um, there's methods based on just processing the signal from the alignment errors, um, which has certain advantages and disadvantages. Um, so advantages are it's relatively fast to just see look at the density of errors along the reference um, and it's also relatively easy to trace back um, issues if, if you see anyone um, in your call to, to where it came from but on the other hand it's um, there's strong biases towards the used reference sequence yeah do you use 37 release 38 release do you have um, telemeter telomere or maybe at some point um, population specific um, whole genome assembly from the pan genome project and um, it's, it's also challenging to cluster these um, signals um, reliably um, there's also methods based on local assembly which is very nice and very strong because it gives you high quality consensus sequences as i showed you earlier but um, it's also relatively hard to do this assembly well it's computationally challenging and if you're not good at um, identifying small um, or relatively small um, um, regions, then um, your, local, your local assembly degrades into whole genome assembly, which is then um, computationally, again, very expensive or even unfe infeasible. But um, it, this is very nice. If you have um, sufficient coverage and a good assembler, you can really um, decipher well um, the structure variants, even in complex regions. Um, and um, a third approach, so to say, is that um, people take um, machine learning methods, um, for example, some kind of deep learning, then they will have to somehow obtain good inputs. So they either use um, existing tools, which of course have weaknesses, or they simulate data, which of course has the issue of, um, yeah, maybe the simulated data doesn't correspond so well to, to reality. But um, yeah, then they, they train their model and then they're trying to unravel even complex structure variant calls and uh, which is a nice approach. But on the other hand, um, how do you actually want to benchmark this? Because there for complex variants, there really is no good um, benchmark yet. So you really have to rely on your simulated data. Um, so things that are that is missing from the state of the art by our experience is um, you want methods that have um, highly comparable or reproducible calls between um, more than one sample. So most of these methods focus on one sample, but if you have a family and you're looking for the novo variants, you really want to exclude that if you see something in the in the, in the index patient, um, you really want to make sure that you don't see this call in other family members. And a similar use case is with tumor normal pairs, right? If you see the variant in the, if you find a somatic variant, you really want to make sure that it's not in the, um, not in the in the matched normal sample. So, and the same goes for larger groups of, of samples like cohorts, collectors, or even po populations. And um, another challenge is low coverage regions. So how do you handle this? And um, of course, it would be nice if you could somehow be more agnostic, agnostic about the used reference genome. So you can use telemetry telomere, um, maybe for calling because you have fewer artifacts there and um, then project your results to the 37 or 38 release 
the genome release you're actually using because you have good clinical annotations on them. So um, state-of-the-art in benchmarking is more or less, there's a genome in a bottle benchmark. So it's just a consortium to create high quality um, variant calls. They start with a sample, for example, the human genome 002, which is like the standard example, um, this, which was subjected over a long time to multiple assays, Illumina reads, long reads, linked reads, what have you. Um, they yeah, made calls, merged them, did some curation, and then in 2020 came up with the the gold standard um, for variant calls. Um, and now you take a tool, for example, um, our competitor of our method more or less sniffles two, um, you get a variant call file from that, then you put it into a um, benchmark program by the same authors as um, sniffles two, actually. <laughs> well, maybe there's a bias there, I don't know. Um, and you get a benchmark score and detailed reports for each of your variants. So, um, and, and this is, this is um, I think, a sane approach, but well, there are also some weaknesses in there. The callers are not perfect. The gold standard is certainly not perfect and it's biased. And if you're using yeah, the benchmark tool from the same authors of a, a variant caller, there's also some biases in there, I would say. So um, regarding challenges, um, there, there are some in the detection and benchmarks and most of them relate to tandem repeats, I would say. Um, so they they make everything ugly. <laughs> the the signal tends to break apart, as we already saw on the first slide. Um, identifying these regions for local assembly is hard. If you do it too small, if you go too small, then you can't get a good consensus of a representation of all of your signal. If your region is too big, then it really becomes computationally infeasible to do um, cons local consensuses. And um, if you're using local assembly as we do, you end up in whole genome de novo assembly, which is tough. And um, of course, um, if you have low coverage samples in there, um, picking up the sample in other, picking up the signal in other samples becomes um, um, very challenging, in particular in these um, tandem repeat regions. So, um, for example, um, if you're looking at another screenshot, so what we're seeing here um, on the bottom again are these read alignments um, of um, Oxford nanopore reads. It is in a low complexity tandem repeat region. And um, we see up here. Um, an insertion call from the gold standard, which is shifted to the left, just like kind of, kind of an implicit or more or less implicit um, convention from a genome in a bottle. They try to left shift the variance in case of um, ambiguity. And um, both the Sniffles 2 caller and um, the, the, um, the, the benchmarking Truvari tool, they don't, um, apparently don't, don't, know or don't interpret this left shifting correctly. So you get the call at the other end of the tandem repeat region. And if you run your benchmark and you don't left shift as the benchmark does, then um, the, 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 the benchmarking tool is not able to connect these two um, variants to each other, which is um, not, I would say it's not so much of a problem in, um, in practice if you were, wanted to work with a variant call, but if you are trying to, um, yeah, work to make a have a systematic approach of developing your method and trying to assess the results it's challenging if your benchmark doesn't work so um, there's other issues for some reason the benchmark masks certain parts of the genome as yeah having no reliable calls yeah so as indicated on the on the bottom but um, there is a call in the gold standard there is a call in um in, in that that the read mapper does um, you can Obviously, as you can see here, the signal is pretty good, pretty strong, but for some reason they exclude the region from their um, from the so-called tier one region. So you don't see this in the benchmark results, which means these regions that are clearly callable are not represented in the in the gold standard and the benchmark, which also is an issue. So then there is also disagreement from what we would see from the data and the genome. So here the gold standard sets says it's a 60 base pair deletion. Um, but if you look at the data, the deletion is probably much smaller. So um, this is also kind of challenging um, if, if yeah, you, you can't really um, have a good assessment of the quality of your method. So um, after showing you all of these challenges, I will now um, go into a bit of detail of our novel approach for um, structure variant detection. So um, first of all, we align the reads to the reference region. Uh, we extract, um, as, as mentioned earlier, the um, structure variant signal by, by um, yeah, something that's more or less the, the um, 
read um, uh, alignment error density across the across the genome. Um, next, we um, this extracted signal is clustered um, using using kernel approaches, um, and um, then in these individual um, in these individual um, yeah regions that were identified to have candidate regions for um, structure variants, um, we cluster the reads um, and try to break up the different alleles. Yeah, most likely it's two alleles only, but in case of copy number variations. Um, or reference errors, if things are too collapsed, there can be more alleles. We try to assign the um, reads to clusters, um, perform local assembly of these clusters in, um, to create a consensus region, and um, in the end, align them back to um, the reference um, that is to be used for, for reporting the variants, um, and then um, assign them to the samples of origin, whether it's family members or tumor normal samples, and then perform a genotyping. So we know whether it's a, the variant is there in heterozygous or homozygous state. Um, so overall, um, I, I um, hopefully could show, tell you that um, structural variant detection is still challenging, although we have now long read data for um, not so high cost, but um, the current methods, they have weaknesses, the available benchmarks and gold standards have weak weaknesses. And um, we need novel methods to have reliable genotyping of variants across families, cohorts, and um, yeah, more than one sample, which is really, um, I think, missing in many methods. And um, essential for this is a good, high quality and still fast local assembly step. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Manuel. Are there questions? Oh, yeah. Uh, thank you, Manuel, for this nice talk. Um, I have a question regarding, you said you, you could use only one genome build for this uh, benchmarking and so on. Is this an anti bias to have only one genome for uh, benchmarking and 